There's one thing that God requires of us. And there's one thing that's demanded of us, obviously, as preachers, if we're going to really preach, is that we can say what I think is the most unique thing to say this side of eternity. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach. There's never been a revival that superseded the Methodist revival. John Wesley's heart was strangely warmed at a quarter to nine on the 24th of May, 1738. And immediately God dropped a life call in the heart of that man. He changed the character of the world. I reminded you last night that Wesley preached 600 sermons in a row and only six of them inside of churches. We raise our hat to him now, they raise their boot to him in the day he lived. Finney preached 28 nights in a row and never made an altar call. He didn't preach God's love, he preached the wrath of God. He didn't say you're a nice little person, God loves you, but he hates you. And he says, God is angry with the wicked every day. He didn't preach love, he preached judgment. He didn't preach mercy, he preached judgment. He didn't preach God's love, he preached God's wrath. He didn't preach heaven, he preached hell, he didn't preach grace, he preached law. Night after night he pummeled those people and they listened until they were in a state of almost mental exhaustion and finally the fire of God would break out. Remember he went to a city like Rochester, New York and had a crusade there for about two months and left a hundred thousand people genuinely born again of the Spirit of God that changed the character of that city. And as I reminded you yesterday, a true revival, I don't care how many people come to the altar, how much you give the evangelist. If it doesn't change the moral atmosphere of the community, it's not revival. It may be evangelism. Revival is the work of the Spirit of God in the church. Evangelism is the work of the church in the world. See, according to American cultural Christianity, all you would have to do is repeat a prayer or maybe attend church or do some sort of other outward thing that appears culturally Christian. But we can't define our Christianity based on what the culture is defining it as. It has to be defined by the Word of God. And only the Word of God can define what it is. I think one of the best definitions of Christianity, honestly, is found in 1 John chapter 2. And it says, the man who says that I know God, the man who says I know Jesus and that I'm a Christian, that I'm born again, the man who says that with his mouth, who's professing like 240 million Americans profess faith in Jesus, the one who says that I know him but does not obey his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. The truth is not in him. Folks, what's it going to be like? And I've tried to imagine this. What is it going to be like when we stand before the throne? Every pastor, every evangelist. When I stand there, everyone in this pulpit stands there. And everyone who's ever taken the gospel to their lips. And we stand before a holy Christ. And the books are opened. I can't. I can't bear the thought that I would have preached for 20 years here in New York City from this pulpit and that to keep the money flowing or to keep the crowds coming and every seat filled that I should give a half gospel or dilute it so I won't offend you. Christ being, being full of his authority and walking everything he's got all of that that I just went through that's all we got. That's all we got. A vapor, a mist, just a blink in, in, in eternity. <clears throat> Are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? Because we got to ask ourselves that. Well, I'll tell you what God looks for. Is there a man who fears him? Oh, beloved, because God says to this man, will I look? Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, keep me on my knees. The fear of God. 
said, I thought many great things, but the greatest thing that I've ever thought of, the most awesome, the most terrifying, the most shattering thought I've ever had is my personal accountability to God one day. His feet are like burnished brass, his face is like the sun in its strength, his eyes are living coals of fire, his tongue is a sharp to edged sword. One man who fears God and hates sin with a passion. No, 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 no. The man who only wants his sins forgiven is trifling with Christianity. He who is to be feared. This is not a time to play games. This is an extremely dangerous time to play games with God. God should bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. And so I'm going right back, back, back to the foundation. Will you remind people of the goodness and the severity of God? The most precious thing we ever handle is the human soul. The Pieta one day will go up in dust. The Sistine Chapel will be blown to smithereens. But the soul of a man will live forever and ever and ever and ever. Either in eternal darkness or eternal bliss. There's one thing that God requires of us. And there's one thing that's demanded of us, obviously, as preachers, if we're going to really preach, is that we can say what I think is the most unique thing to say this side of eternity. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach.